Okay, so a little bit about about these server setup tools. Um, um, some of you may have seen this slide before. Just a little bit of background that DHS2, the web-based version um, running over the web, I think we first implemented in Kerala, in India, around about 2007. It started to become quite widespread running it, running it over the internet from about 2010. Uh, Kenya, Ghana, and Rwanda were very early examples of, of running DHS2 on the web. One of the things we discovered quite early on that many and probably most people who were, had the awesome responsibility for setting up and running the service were quite inexperienced at doing that. And so the challenge was to try to take best practice that we had from our documentation and to incorporate that into something that was reasonably easy to deploy and to learn. And yeah, try to make it as easy as possible to do the right thing and as hard as possible to do the wrong thing. That's the reason why we set the SSL up as a kind of default. Um, I created a set of scripts, which I can't remember when, it was around 2014, it's a long time ago, um, for just setting up basic DHIS2 environment on a Linux server. Um, we did a couple of early server academies based around those tools. I say still in why I don't think it's any longer still in widespread use. I think there's still a few people still using the legacy tools, but um, hopefully not so many. Um, one of the things we found as as things have grown and as systems have become more complicated and particularly more and more people using tracker, where there's more security concerns and also more performance concerns, um, it was quite hard to manage the way that it was being done at that time. So when it's said about developing a, a kind of new generation of those tools, and a lot of people on this group have played a big part in some of those. Um, call it DHS Tools NG for want of a better name, should come up with a better name, I suppose. Uh, the fundamental difference, I guess, with the old tools is that we don't run anything any we don't run everything on the same server in the way we used to right the old tools we had a linux server and you ran your reverse proxy and your postgres database and your tomcat instances and everything was running together in the same memory space in the same in the same um, cpu slice um, We needed to have a way of, of breaking those things apart a bit in order to be able to scale better and in order to be able to secure the system better. Um, what we started doing yeah, a couple of years back, I think the Rwanda was probably the first example that predates these tools really, is we said we put all those pieces into separate containers, right? So the reverse proxy should run in its own container, the Tomcats should run in their own container, and the Postgres should run in its own container. Um, the container technology that we're using is something called LXD. I know most people who are familiar with containers have probably come across Docker. Um, essentially, all of these things all use the same basic Linux kernel feature, which allows the partitioning of processes that they can run um, in some kind of isolated environment from one another. The, the Linux kernel feature people are interested in is something called C groups. Um, yeah, so what we're looking for, the next generation tools, is a much stronger emphasis on security. That was largely because there were more and more people using Tracker. Uh, but also, we had a couple of incidents of hacking. Um, because of, of poorly configured service. So one of the advantage of, of putting each of these little components in containers is that we can also make them very simple and try to define them very tightly. Um, so one of the things we've done is gone through CIS security benchmarks for different components and tried to go through the checklist to make sure that they are as close as possible to reasonably compliant with security best practices. Um, the kind of target, if you like, what it's aimed at is installing a virtual environment within a single host machine. That's the, 
That's the simplest use case, and I'm going to talk a little bit about variations. But in most cases, that is what most people need, right? They have a virtual server. They want to create a, a stable, secure DHIS installation on it, running on a, on a, on a cloud VPS. Um, sometimes we make some variations to that architecture, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a subsequent slide. As it's also frequently installed on physical in infrastructure. It's quite easy to set it up, as hopefully you'll see later this morning. Um, and I've made quite a few fixes over the weekend to make it even easier than it was. Um, but having an easy setup is not a substitute for having good experience and training. Um, in, in fact, in some ways, it's a bit scary. You know, if it's if it's very easy for someone to, with no experience at all, to take a blank server and install DHS2 on it, then um, it means that you're going to have a lot of inexperienced servers running, server administrators running very critical um, systems. So, yeah, please bear that in mind. The fact that it's easy to set up doesn't mean that um, that's a substitute for gaining experience and skills. It is probably not, it's not suitable for all environments. It's got a particular target in mind. Um, I know like BAO systems, for example, um, HISP South Africa, people running hundreds of DHS2 instances. Um, if you're running a big operation like that, then first of all, you don't need my tools to do it. You, you, you should have sufficient skills that you develop something much better than what I've done anyway. Um, but for a large majority of use cases where you've got a relatively small number of instances, uh, we found that it works reasonably well. <laughs> okay, so kind of hardware variations that we see um, commonly, they generally fall into one of the following three, I think. Commercial cloud infrastructure, right? Running on a Lin node is very common, running on AWS, running on Contabo. Um, the other thing that we commonly see is where well, it's running on virtual machines on some kind of national infrastructure, right? Uh, often government may have a national data center, the Ministry of Health may have a national data center, um, and the DHS2 servers are installed in there. Um, Almost always on VMware, it turns out. It's not my favorite environment. Um, there's almost always performance problems that we find. Um, that's not something that's particular about VMware. It's usually the way that it's being set up. But sometimes um, DHS2 is, is directly installed on physical hardware, right? There's quite a few places I can think of currently where physical hosts have been acquired and DHS2 is installed on those. So there's quite a lot of variety out there. Um, I don't really put these in any particular order of preferences. preference. There's quite a lot of advantages and disadvantages to each of the above, right? And what you end up doing is largely depends on, you know, what's convenient, what kind of skill set you have. Um, and what constraints you might have in terms of policy, legal environment, etc. So for a lot of places, for example, it might be convenient to run a system on a LIN node, but legislation might be that systems are run in country. So you have to look at different options. Important considerations to bear in mind, depending on what you're doing up, is, yeah, first of all, it takes a lot more management and technical skills to operate your own data center. So I know a lot of a lot of places and uh, are, are keen to operate their own data center. Um, it's not a bad thing to do. I don't discourage it, but you do need to make sure that you've got the management skills and the technical skills to be able to do that. Putting putting up a server on on a Lin node um, is a much much easier thing to do. Um, and there's all kinds of things around the hardware infrastructure, the environment, the network, um, things like that, that are taken care for you. 
be very careful with VMware, over-provisioned VMware, should I say. Um, it's quite common that um, VMware environments tend to get over-provisioned. So you get told you've got a you've got a server with 16 CPUs, but those are virtual CPUs. You might not might not actually have the resources that you think you have. I have a typo there. The other thing we sometimes see is dodgy licenses. People running national data centers on on um, VMware, which is not fully licensed, and then you come up come with some limitations and difficulties around that. Probably the most important consideration is, regardless of what your environment is, how you do it is what is your backup plan, right? Where do you take your backups? Where are they stored off site? Um, how do you go about making sure that that happens? Frequently, I mean, it, it's, it's quite common when people are starting up a DHS2 project from, from the beginning and they go to the budget and they say, well, we need a server. Um, just having a server or the server is not sufficient for running a DHS2 environment. You also need to have a place where you're, where you're putting your backups, which is not on the same server, and preferably not even in the same data center. Either way, you need to have a backup plan. Your backup plan is going to be different depending on what kind of environment that you have. Okay, is that a basic architecture for those who don't know um, of a DHIS2 installation? You've got a couple of required bits, right? The, the main bit, I suppose, is whoops, I try to click on that and it changed slide. The main bit is your DHS2 instance itself. This is what is typically a Tomcat servlet engine, which is running the DHS war file. Um, depending on your setup, you may have more than one DHS2 instance. Uh, often we recommend that besides your production instance, you might have a training instance, you might have a staging instance, etc. So you can have more than one DHS2 instance running. You need to have a database in which to store your stuff. Um, nowadays, that database is always a PostgreSQL database. Uh, it's possible to have more than one database. Um, you can have different instances store their data on different databases. Um, you need to have some kind of reverse proxy, um, either Apache 2 or Nginx, um, even HA proxy, I think, is another common one. Um, this the reverse proxy performs a, a number of important roles, probably the most important one being SSL termination, but also providing a routing to your different containers. Um, you need to have some kind of monitoring system so that you can keep an eye on the health of your system. Um, there's again a lot of choices for what you can use for monitoring. What I installed by default with with the installation scripts that we're going to look at is something called Moonin. It's not the most beautiful monitoring tool in the world, uh, but it gives you most of the basics that you need without much particular additional configuration. So the way that we set it up um, in the environment I describe is each of these things run within their own container. So the host machine, Think of this big round box here as the host machine. The host machine should be very, very simple, right? There shouldn't be many services running on this machine at all. Typically, most important thing you want to have running on here is your host based firewall. Um, I configure UFW by default, simple, simple wrapper over Linux IP tables. Um, things I like about it, things I like less about it, but it works. Uh, and you need to have your LXD hypervisor running. This is the thing which basically allows you to run your different containers. Beyond that, you don't want to have too much running on the host at all. Keep the host as simple as possible because your host has got to be as secure as you can make it. Because if your host gets compromised, then essentially each and any of your containers can be compromised. The advantage of running all of these services in separate containers is we can limit the damage. If any one of your particular containers get hacked, um, you can take some precautions to make sure that those 
those compromised containers can't affect others. Okay, I've got on this slide that this you can run this on Ubuntu 2004 or 1804 host. Currently, my latest um, set of of scripts that are available on GitHub are primarily tested on Ubuntu 2004. So if you're starting out fresh, start out with 2004 LTS. They can be made to work on 18.04 as well, but I've not tested recently. Um, and uh, so there may be a few small teething problems. In theory, they should be able to run on Debian as well. Um, but again, um, I've not had the opportunity to test it on that. So my, my suggested environment is to use Ubuntu 20.04. Either way, when working with Ubuntu, particularly with a production system, um, you should work with what's called a long-term service edition or an LTS edition. They're typically the ones with the 04 um, at the end of them. So 18.04, 20.04, the next one will be 22.04. They get released every two years. And the advantage of using an LTS edition is that you can you'll continue to receive updates for um, I think up to six years. Uh, where if you if you go for one of the latest releases in between those LTSs, then you'll find that your system needs to be changed, reinstalled, or upgraded much more frequently. Okay, so that's the basic layout of the various containers that we see. I just realized that while I'm in full screen mode. I can't see the time. Let me quickly check that. Uh, we are already, already running out of time. I'm going to overrun a little bit um, and take a little bit of the next session. So we'll stop, at, let's say, in the next five minutes. And we'll pinch a little bit of the next session to finish off. Okay, so a couple of variations. This might be the last slide I'll fit in in five minutes. A couple of variations that we see in the above pattern. Um, very, very common. People want to use an Nginx proxy instead of the Apache 2. Um, this is a discussion that's been going on for some time now. Um, I still need to make a strong configuration using Nginx. I, I've done it many times manually, but I just don't have an automated script for it yet. Um, I'll try and do that, in fact, over the next couple of days when I get a chance, because, yeah, people ask for it a lot. Um, I prefer Apache 2 still, <laughs> but um, there are some advantages of using Nginx as well, and people increasingly are more familiar with it. The other variation you often see is that you know, a proxy server already exists somewhere in the environment, and so instead of configuring your proxy there, inside your LXD host, often this proxy is somewhere else outside in the environment. Um, the other thing you commonly see is, is a database provisioned on a different machine. This is often done for performance reasons, um, adds a little bit of complexity when you do that, um, particularly if you're running in a cloud environment, if you want to run the database on a different VM, because, um, all the traffic between your Tomcat and your database is going to run unencrypted through the through the cloud provider's network. Um, so ideally, you need to make SSL connections from the Tomcat to the database. It's not too difficult to do. It just adds an extra little bit of complexity. The other thing that I'd like to see more often, but is not very common at all, um, particularly people running tracker databases and particular people running databases which carry quite a lot of, of PII, as they call it, patient identifiable data, or personal identifiable data. Um, good practice is to not only have encryption in transit, like what you get from using SSH and SSL, but you also want to have encryption at rest. What that means is that when the system is powered down, everything on the disk is encrypted. Um, it's something that we should do more of. It's not very difficult to do, um, and we might get an opportunity uh, 
over the coming weeks to run through the process of, of doing it. The risk is, of course, if people don't know exactly what they're doing and they lose the keys to the encrypted volume, then they can lose access to all their data. So be careful with encryption. Now, the common thing that we see, um, it's not so common, but it's getting there. Um, often you have more than one of these environments. Right, this is Rwanda, I think of in particular. I think Amza is probably on this call, maybe Andrew. Um, there they started off and they had an environment pretty much like what I described in the previous slide. And this run four, five, six Tomcat containers on it and realized that they were running out of resources. So they made a second one and now they have a third one, right? Um, the other thing that is a minor variation to what we'll do today anyway, it's not so minor, fairly major variation, is that instead of using the default file system that's provided, um, is you set up an LVM or a ZFS file system, which provides some additional, many additional advantages, in fact, particularly the ZFS. Um, but, you need to have a pretty good understanding of how ZFS works, feel comfortable with your file system before really attempting to install um, and, and use it in a production setting. It works very, very well. It's particularly good for running databases with encrypted volumes, as I was pointed out above, because uh, the latest version of ZFS um, includes a native encryption on it, so it's very easy to create, to set up a volume for, for running ZFS. The other thing that we often see increasingly is that besides that list of containers that I had in my diagram, there are many other types of containers that people want to have or need to have in their environment. Um, and I've got a slide here which talks about some of the common ones that um, we find. But I think because of all of our, our orientation stuff, we kind of run over our session. So Martin, I don't know, can we pause here? Recording has started again. Okay, so we mentioned earlier that the, the installation scripts by default only creates the minimum number of containers that you really need to be able to run DHS2. That's the reverse proxy, the database, simple monitor, and your DHS2 application instances. But there are quite a number of additional types of, of containers that you might want to create. And these are typical ones that I found myself creating over the last couple of years. Um, which are not part of the de default installation. Some of them are now becoming so standard it makes sense that we should find a way for people to be able to easily script them. Email gateway, very common. Uh, people want to be able to send alerts somehow. Email is one of the best ways of alerting. It's quite easy to also link an email gateway to something like Telegram or something like that. SMS gateway, as we set up quite recently in Rwanda, so that all your instances can make use of a, a single SMS gateway for sending and receiving SMSs. Um, got some nice examples of setting up small containers just for running running um, ad hoc odds and ends of services. And something else which is increasingly becoming important is the ability to run Docker containers alongside. And one of the easiest, one of the best ways of doing that is creating a, a separate container in your architecture, which is simply for running Dockers. And again, you can have more than one of these. So we may get a chance to, later in the month to talk about some of those other container types. Um, it's very useful to know how to make containers yourself, and um, then you can put together environments which are more suited to exactly what your requirements are. Bear in mind, I think, as I mentioned before, the fact that you've got a simple setup script doesn't mean that um, you don't need to understand as much as possible about the way your environment is working, particularly if you want to create new containers. Okay, well, I 
a little bit of tour of what's actually on those containers, but I've got to keep this brief. We'll do it in more detail um, just before lunch anyway. Um, the Postgres container by default now is running Postgres 13. Uh, it had been running Postgres 12 up to now, but there's all kinds of big performance gains to be had by running Postgres 13 as a database. So now we've made it to the default. Um, all the configuration for Postgres, you'll find in that file. Um, usually after installing it, and again, we'll see it a little bit later, you want to go in there and tweak a few of those parameters to tune up your Postgres server to suit your environment. Tomcat is running Tomcat 9. Um, it's running under system D. Uh, it's quite well secured, I think. Um, and that adds a little bit of complexity to some things. <laughs> but again, we, 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 we'll see it a little bit later. The home directory for your DHIS2 home um, is opt DHIS2. That's the default on DHIS2. It's actually a, a little documented feature. If you don't specify the DHIS2 home directory, then by default, DHIS2 is going to look inside opt DHIS2 to look for your DHIS.conf and things like that. Um, the proxy server, uh, yeah, for each of your upstream locations, they're actually created as little snippets inside that folder. If you were using Nginx, then we'd create that similarly as etc. Nginx upstream. Again, we look at what those snippets look like. Um, there's a UFW um, firewall which is running on each of those containers, basically to restrict access um, to the minimum for each of them. So for example, your Tomcat container, you need to be able to access it from the proxy, but they don't need to be able to access one another. Um, each of them need to access the database. But So whatever the minimum requirements are, what containers need to interact, we've set firewall rules on each of them. So um, that is taken care of for you largely. Um, you can set resource limits on your containers. Again, we're going to look at this shortly. Um, one of the advantages of putting them into containers in the first place is we can make sure that they, we can restrict the amount of RAM each of them can use. We can restrict the amount of CPU that each of them can use um, and the like. I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Logging. Um, Tomcat uh, uses the system D journal uh, for logging. And so the best way of looking at those logs, in fact, is using journal control rather than rather than um, browsing through Catalina dot out. <laughs> uh, again, I, I get the opportunity to show you how that works a little bit later on. Um, I've configured a little bit of customization on the proxy so that we get some performance logging on it, which doesn't come by default. Um, Monitoring, as I said, use, use a semi called Moonin is on there by default. You can change that. And one of the things that we want to do is to also create an automated setup for things like Prometheus and Grafana. Um, that Moonin, it's not very beautiful, but it is easily configurable out of the box. And it gives you some very useful day-to-day -day monitoring of things which are important to you. I'll show you some pictures shortly. Um, Increasingly, we found the need for profiling. If, you're, if your application is, particularly if it's struggling for one reason or another, performance-wise or something else, um, Glowroot has been a tool which over the last year we found um, incredibly useful to put onto your containers. I'm going to provide some assistance to make that much easier to, to configure. And as I said, this various other monitoring solutions could be used. Um, Moonin kind of looks like this. You see these graphs look very 1980s. Um, but you can see your basic statistics of what your Tomcat is doing. Um, it shows you the amount of, amount of threads and how busy they are. If those busy threads start to, start to um, reach a peak, 
then you know that you've got an issue somewhere. Um, Moonin will also monitor your Nginx or your Apache, give you some idea what your daily load is, what your weekly load is, what your monthly load is. These are some very useful graphs around what's happening with your Postgres. Um, this is an example of a sick system because you can see all that yellow stuff are connections which are sitting idle in transaction. Um, that's an, if you see a system like that, that's an example of where in fact the Tomcat is, is overloaded for some reason and is not able to, it opened a lot of transactions, but it's not actually servicing them. Um, this particular uh, graph from, from Moonin is very useful for diagnosing basic database issues that you might be having. Uh, I leave that, but now it's a boring slide. Root, as I said, is something that increasingly we're finding very, very useful. It's quite easy to install on your server and gives you a really quite deep insight into what's happening with particular web transactions, what's happening in your JVM, um, what sort of slow traces. This is just a screenshot because it's, it's not very interesting looking at a demo server because there's no traffic on it. I might request some folk later on whether they'll allow us to have a look at Glowroot on one of the live servers, but I don't want to do that without getting permission first. Where we plan to go from here, and um, this is some of these plans have been sitting for a while. Um, one is the installation scripts themselves. Currently, there are rather a horrible mess of bash scripts. I mean, they 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 pretty much work, but um, they're becoming harder and harder to maintain. They're a bit ugly. Uh, we want to change this to using Ansible. One of the things that you might find is that LXD actually is very Ansible friendly. Um, you can, you can, if people are familiar with Ansible, they know what I mean. You can make connections to your LXE containers natively from Ansible, so you can define them all using Ansible playbooks. I'd like to try to change all of my current bash setup scripts so they do it like that um yeah they've been talking for a long time about about getting email to telegram on alerting um the transition from apache 2 to nginx for me it's not really a transition i still like using apache 2 but i know a lot of people want to use nginx so um again that's something i want to get actually working probably be before the end of this workshop so that if people want to use Nginx, they can. We've talked already a bit about additional containers and the documentation. Documentation currently is a little bit sparse. Um, it's an ongoing project to improve that, to make it a little bit better. Okay, so that ends this section, really. I've got a little bit of background reading here, which I advise people to take a look at. The installation tools themselves, which we will look at this morning, are there. Um, this is the, the kind of primary documentation site for LXD, um, for, for Glowroot. We didn't talk much about ZFS, but um, um, advise you to take a look at that. Uh, Orc, don't worry too much about Orc for the moment. Um, okay, so that's pretty much my very, very brief overview of the, the architecture from a high level view. As I say, if you have particular questions or issues you want to raise, please do so in the chat Slack channel. I want to move over quickly to doing a, a little bit of a hands-on demo of LXD.